Prairie Lakes Church. I know it's uh, not the first weekend of the year. It's the second one, but I'm going to say it anyways. Happy New Year. I know for a lot of us, this is probably our first weekend back. Um, and then uh, let's just say this real quick, okay? Uh, uh, Prairie Lakes Church Decora. Uh, I know this is not your first weekend. You guys opened at Christmas Eve, but this is your first kind of normal Sunday weekend service. So we're very, very, on behalf of Osage, New Hampton, Cedar Falls, Fort Dodge, Independence, Grinnell, and our online campus, Prairie Lakes Church in Decorah, welcome. Okay. Welcome. Glad you're here. All right. Okay. Hey, uh, my name is Jesse Tink. You probably are familiar with me, um, but the guy next to me, you may not be familiar with, although I'm going to guess you are, especially if you've joined our online campus in this last year. But this is Cody Carraway. Cody is our digital pastor. And so I want to say to you, man, I'm, I'm really glad that you're joining us yeah, this weekend. Excited to be here. Yeah, it's cool. Um, so uh, we're going to explain why Cody's joining me here this weekend here in a second, but um, we've had, uh, man, we've been through an interesting season. We're still in this interesting season and uh, we actually hired you January of 2021. Yeah. And that was right on the heels of, uh, uh, man, a, a 2020 that was dominated by COVID. Okay. Yeah. And we learned a ton as a church during that. And we learned a ton as a church digitally during that, which really led to kind of your, your hire and you've been helping us out. But let me just set the stage, okay? Um, 2020, we were uh, broadcasting our weekend services, that's fair to say. We were recording a service at our Cedar Falls campus Saturday night um, and then just kind of showing it, you know? And that was kind of our, the extent of our digital <laughs> strategy, so to speak. And we learned a ton when we couldn't gather in the room anymore and we shifted our mentality from uh, just broadcasting a weekend service to an online campus. And you've been heading that up here for the last yeah. year. Year, yeah. And uh, really, we uh, formally launched, we were kind of building up in the first several months of me being on staff to a formal launch, which we did on Easter. Um, and since then, we uh, really brought like all of the next steps that we have at our yeah. physical campuses to be available online. Uh, it's just been really cool yeah. to see the fruit of it. I mean, yeah. we've had uh, faith lines and baptisms and we've welcomed uh, our first members uh, and we've had people engaging and just yeah. growing in their walk with Jesus through our next step. Yeah. So it's been really cool. It's been very cool. Yeah. And so uh, we know here uh, 2022 and beyond, we're in kind of a, a hybrid attendance. A lot of us are at a physical campuses, but also joining online. We know we have a growing online only campus from people in and around our state and then across our country and even world. OK, um, so uh, Cody's been helping us more recently. Um, not just lead our, our online campus, but he's taken charge of a brand new central ministry uh, that we're calling our digital strategies division and uh, helping us disciple people digitally a little bit more effectively. And then um, also really helping us reach a brand new audience because 2022 um, if we're talking about people who are not interested in church or people who are kind of curious about the church, where are they going to get us first? Yeah. Yeah. And we just know like we're going where they're, we're spending the time and that a lot of that is, is digitally. So uh, we're really positioning ourselves well with this new division to reach yep. those people, uh, but then move people across all of our campuses to be able to take steps in their uh, discipleship yeah. uh, process yep. um, online here. Yeah, exactly right. So um, this weekend marks the first weekend in a brand new series that we're kicking off 2022 with called Attention War. Okay. Attention war. So that's why Cody's joining us because uh, the war for our attention is red hot, really is. And then really the primary <laughs> tools for competing for our attention are digital. Okay. So let me just set the stage. All right. Uh, I am 40. I've got a, an 11 year old. I've got a nine year old. Okay. So sixth grade and third grade. Uh, and uh, they're still kind of in the stage where they are like pretend playing sometimes, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, you did that, I'm sure, as, as a kid. I, da I did that as, as a kid. Um, I wanted to be Michael Jordan, okay? What was, what was your kind of pretend? Actually, same, Michael Jordan. Boy. Michael didn't plan that. We, and we both <laughs> look like him a lot, so. Um, but okay, so uh, my kids, uh, when they pretend play, you know what they pretend, pretend play as? YouTubers. You, yes, YouTubers, right? And so in their kind of imaginary scenario, they're, they're running massive YouTube audiences and they're talking about marketing and they're talking about branding, right? YouTube has got, quote unquote, has got my kids, right? And we're in a generation where that's not gonna change. 
It just, it just isn't, okay? And so as a parent, though, this can kind of make me, a lot of us, kind of nervous, right? Because what we want to do is we want to go, oh my gosh, my kids are on screens all the time, or I'm on screens all the time, and so I just want to limit screen time, right? It's as simple as that? Um, no, <laughs> not that simple. <laughs> okay. Um, but I, I think it is helpful to start with just clarifying the problem, because like you said, I think it's easy just to go down the, uh, the trail, just simplifying this to a technology problem. But... Uh, it's really not. And if we look at just the history of technology, it's really done some amazing things. And uh, just practically, I'm really thankful I was able to get in a warm car yeah. and drive here yeah. uh, today. Uh, but I'm, I'm thankful for this and you're thankful for that, yeah. right? Yep. And uh, so it's not inherently bad and it's also not new. I mean, technology has been around since the garden. There were tools to cultivate the ground. And then, and then you go to Genesis 6 and Noah built an ark. And that was a form of technology. Yes. And Jesus, he was a carpenter. He used tools. And uh, a lot of our New Testament uh, is from Paul. Yep. And he used letters, which was a form of uh, technology. Right. So uh, technology isn't inherently bad. Um, and we're able to leverage it in just really cool ways uh, for the kingdom. And if you look back at Acts, okay. uh, the Roman roads, uh, that was just a great tool, great technology in the advance of the gospel. And similarly, uh, we talked about some fruit uh, from our online campus. We're just really able to uh, reach people and invest in people yeah. that without technology, we wouldn't be able to. Exactly right. Exactly right. So at the, at the core, this is you're saying it's not just a technology problem. So if it's not a technology problem, what kind of problem is it? Yeah. Uh, well, first, I'd say, again, just what it's not. It's not a data privacy oh, problem, yeah, okay. I think. We've seen the, the headlines, we uh, have seen some of the lawsuits uh, even, um, and, and that's a problem, uh, but even if that was perfect and yeah. we had the data privacy thing down uh, pat, uh, the core of this problem uh, still exists. And uh, it's really a problem with what these companies are selling. Okay. Uh, so Gmail, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, news outlets, uh, they're not selling their platform or even the content uh, that's on their platform, um, nor are they competing for um, uh, your money or your data, uh, they're competing for you to continue to use their products. So ultimately, uh, we're the product. Uh, so it's not a technology problem, it's an attention problem, and your attention equals their profit. Okay, okay. So that is, I'm just, that's tough to get my, <laughs> my mind around, right? Because Because I've heard big tech, right? And I can demonize big tech, right? It's the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world, and they're all evil, and so is Apple, even though they try not to be, right? Um, I've heard big data, right? So, you know, somehow Target can get a circular or Shields or, or Cabela's or, you know, whoever can get to me because they know my spending habits, right? And I can demonize them. But you're saying it's not big tech, it's not big data, it's attention. Yep. It's attention, okay? All right. Um, talk to me a little bit more about that. Yeah, exactly. So I, I genuinely think that the uh, greatest spiritual battle for us living in the digital age is in our mind. Hmm. Okay, so because it's not tech and it's not data, because it's a mind problem, an attention problem, all of a sudden it becomes a spiritual battle there. Exactly. And I think that's true for a couple of reasons, because uh, what we believe and think about matters. And, and we all know that, but we also uh, see the apostle Paul knew that in the New Testament, there were several examples of that. And, and secondly, I think the enemy wants to distract us and overwhelm us so we can't make a difference uh, for the, the kingdom. And as more platforms and more uh, uh, competition arises, these companies have to get smarter. And this is where I'm gonna put my nerd classes on <laughs> a, a little bit here. Um, but they bring in neuroscientists and behavioral economists uh, that understand how to create addictive products. So they understand how our brain creates neural pathways and our behavioral biases so that uh, they can leverage the technology to not only get us to stick on the platforms, yeah. uh, but to increase in our usage um, on them. And we've even seen in recent years, uh, like top universities like Stanford yeah. starting to offer classes and curriculum on persuasive technology. Yeah, okay. All right. So if we're tracking with you, we've shifted the location of the problem to something that is in our mind, which feels like it's in our control. Okay. If it's in my mind, it's, for, it's, a, it's a war for my attention. Okay. I can grab my, but then <laughs> you kind of up the ante because now Stanford is on the other side or, you know, scientists are on the other side, right? Um, so, so we're now thinking about this problem through more biological or scientific lenses. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the algorithms of these platforms, they're just designed to be addicting. And the, the secret weapon in this war for our attention are attention traps. Um, and practically, we've all experienced these. I mean, how many times do we go to look at one post, yeah, right. 
watch one video or watch one show and what do we find ourselves doing 90 minutes later? <laughs> Same thing. Still scrolling, <laughs> still watching. Yes, yes. Um, and, and we usually point the blame at ourselves, right, um, but right. it's a little bit unfair because the reality is, is when I'm looking at this screen, on the other side of it, there's a supercomputer that's placing the perfect piece of content yeah. at the perfect time right. uh, to keep my I, attention. I, I don't want to consider myself as having puppet strings, but I kind of do. A little bit. I mean, um, and, and the thing is, is this, uh, these supercomputers don't consider what's best for you or me or for us. Um, yeah. It's only what's right. best for keeping your right. attention. Um, so uh, what's kind of scary about this is it, it uses just incomprehensible amounts of data from past users to know what has worked. So these things only get smarter. And, and what these look like practically, these attention traps, they're the algorithms, uh, they're the uh, recommended video sections on YouTube, the suggested videos on Facebook, the yeah. autoplay feature on Netflix, yep. and, and yep. that really goes on. And um, what's scary is the things that we are paying the most attention to um, are what the algorithms are choosing for us. Yeah, yeah. And that's dangerous. The things that we're paying the most attention to are the things that the algorithms choose for us, right? Yeah, and, and with that is what that is, is not necessarily what we would say is individually most important. Right, right, okay, so let's, let's hit pause here, right? Because we gotta, I think we gotta wrap our minds around this a little bit. Um, just this week, okay, just this week, uh, January 6th, right? And that's a loaded date now in American history. Uh, half the country wants to forget about it, half the country wants to, um, let's just megaphone about it. Right, but it was it was January sixth was a time where we saw people, you know, stream into our capital. That's what happened a year ago uh, this week, and it's not. I don't think it's unfair to say that these attention traps played some kind of role in that. As people got deeper and deeper and deeper into these attention traps that were designed to keep them and hold their attention in something, all of a sudden that kind of became their world, right? And that's an extreme example, okay? Probably one of the most extremes we've ever seen, but on, on I mean, like the rest of us who didn't storm the Capitol, whatever our deal was, whether it's like, I, I wanna buy more gear, I wanna go to this place, I, I wanna um, idolize this person, whatever it is, we're, we're kind of being drawn in unless we become more aware to some pretty scary places, right? Yeah, and I, I think it's helpful uh, to just see kind of the scale of what yeah. our time and attention is placed on. Um, so we put together a chart and yeah. it's not comprehensive. It doesn't include like the hours that we're sleeping or spending time over meals. Um, but what we did is we took um, some published data on the average screen time um, and attention uh, that we spend on various things and to it, uh, we added uh, church, okay. uh, just as a comparison. So if okay. you look at the chart, uh, you'll see the very okay. tiny sliver. So I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stand up and I'm gonna point as you talk about it, okay? So here's the, here's the chart, here's the chart, okay? Yeah. So we have church, news, social media, TV, and internet, okay? Yep. So where's church? Church is that tiny little sliver, that church 1%. Is, church is right here. <laughs> yep. Okay, all so right, that's what else is here? 60 minutes a week, and then if you go to news, Okay, news is here. That's the next one, that's 854 minutes a per week, week on average. And okay. then uh, next in line is social media. Social media is here. 1,015 minutes per week. Okay. And then if you go to the next one at TV, it's 1,428. TV's there. And then the biggest one is TV, or the biggest one's internet usage at nearly 3,000 minutes a and week. And the internet is there. <laughs> so there's and, church, right? And then there's internet, Yep. right? And I think, um, I think it's important to kind of go back to what I was saying uh, earlier, because uh, what we think about matters in a significant portion of our day right there, yep. uh, we are letting algorithms choose uh, what's being inputted into our minds. And I also mentioned that the enemy wants to distract us. Um, so if you started using technology at 15 and you follow these trends, these averages, and you live an average life, uh, by the end of your life, uh, you would have spent nearly seven years of your life on social media. At the end of your life, if this holds true, seven years on social media. Yep. And then nearly <laughs> 10 years of your life watching TV. Okay. Okay. Nearly 20 years of your life on the internet. 20 years of my life spent on the internet, if this yes. is close to being true. Yeah. Okay. Um, that's mind blowing. It just, it just is. Okay. Now at this point here, I want to, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not, um, well, I'm not the oldest guy on our staff, but I am older than you. <laughs> By now, a significant margin, okay? So I'm 40, you are? 
27. 27, okay. Um, so I was born in 81, all right? And as a guy that was born in 81, it's kind of an interesting time to be born because I was born right in the smack dab middle of two generations. You are a millennial, yep. okay? Uh, I am kind of a millennial, but I'm also kind of a Gen Xer. Um, so I, when I, I grew up in my grandparents, my grandma's house had a rotary phone. I learned the card catalog <laughs> when I was, a, when I was a kid. Okay. Um, and then the house that I graduated from had, uh, the computer in it finally and the internet kind of came into it. And, and so I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm right on the, on the edge of two. Now he, uh, as a bridger, I think what I've enjoyed about that is I can kind of speak two languages, sometimes even three languages, because you're just used to translating for, through, through generations. And, and so let's, let's admit that some of the things we've been talking about can really feel overwhelming to even people my age and absolutely older. Yeah. So, so I think there is a um, comparison here that I thought was pretty helpful when we're thinking about this, right? Um, because uh, I can just start to frame up this problem as bad, but I don't really know what to do with it. Um, similarly, as I grew up, um, smoking was kind of that. Okay. Yeah. So when I, when I, when I was a kid, um, there in restaurants, there were smoking sections mm -hmm. and there were non-smoking sections, right? Some of us remember that. Um, and then now there, there aren't, you can't go anywhere and smoke anywhere in the country, right? You just can't. Um, but, but the process of changing over to that was fascinating, right? Because even when I was a little kid on smoking packs or everywhere, there was always the Surgeon General's warning, right? This causes cancer. Like we knew for a long, long, long time, this is horrible for you, right? And if you go and secondhand was also horrible for you, okay? But there was a tipping point by which we somehow we understood that this is really bad and we have to do something about it. We have to fundamentally alter the way that everybody operates or is this is gonna be bad for all of us. And it feels a little bit, it feels a little bit like we're kind of there when it comes to this whole attention war. We understand, we understand that this is a problem. It's kind of overwhelming. It feels a little bit unclear about what exactly we have to do about it, but we know we have to do something, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, help us close the gap then between understanding that we have a big problem, but, but still trying to maybe understand how big and then what to do with it. Yeah, I mean, like you said, this attention problem is, is just so significant. And I think it's helpful, again, nerd glasses yep. uh, back yep. on I here, like it. Uh, to start something with, with something called neuroplasticity. Um, and simply uh, what that means is that our brain is constantly uh, changing and how it works um, is we have some sort of in input into our mind which influences our thoughts and our thoughts influence our heart our beliefs yeah. and then our beliefs um, they influence our action and the more that we repeat this uh, the more entrenched we get in our behaviors and our thought patterns um, and this repetition creates um, what's called neural pathways and these are responsible for um, kind of what's second nature for us our routines our habits uh, the things that we think or do uh, without really putting any conscious thought um, into and practically I mean, we're so entrenched in these behaviors. Um, what we've get is what we've seen the last couple of years. I yep. mean, we see um, higher levels of addiction, mental health problems, isolation, teen depression, suicide, uh, maximum polarization. And Barna, uh, who we've referenced yep. uh, several times, uh, put a study out about this even pre-pandemic on the connected generation. So 18 to 35 uh, year olds. And it exposed a lot of the, the same findings, um, tying it to yep. uh, just increased um, time on these platforms. It said 60% of this generation uh, was experiencing anxiety. Yeah. Um, only one third feels deeply cared for. Um, and despite being hyper-connected, they feel lonely yeah. um, and ultimately just not optimistic about their future. Yeah, so the, the piece of the puzzle here, and I know it's kind of a depressing piece of the puzzle, right? But it's an important piece of the puzzle is that as we allow, or if we allow our attention to be dominated by things that are kind of leading us down attention traps or pulling our puppet strings, what happens is that we can start to almost rewire our brain in a way that starts to influence who we are and how we act. Exactly. Right? And that's an important, that's an, I know it's a depressing piece of the puzzle, but it's an important piece of the puzzle. And this is where we have to shift and start to kind of go, there's some good news here. Yep. <laughs> right? Because it can feel like, it can feel like whether you're a parent of a kid or whether even you're just a, kind of addicted to your phone, okay? It can feel like the war is over um, before it has begun. And it can feel like before you even realize it reached your shores, um, you've rewired your brain and that's it, right? Yeah. Good news there. The good news there 
is uh, um, God's bigger than this war. He really is. He really is, okay? And if we start fighting this with the tools that are given to us in Scripture, which is crazy to think about. It's crazy to think that there's things in Scripture that's actually going to help us beat Facebook in 2022 or TikTok in 2022 or, or you know what I'm saying? It's nuts, yeah. but it's very true, okay? So we're going to spend really the next couple of weeks talking about that with a little bit of an introduction uh, here. So let's, let's just go to a couple of maybe three or four different passages of Scripture together and put our eyes on this and just know over the next couple of weeks um, we're going to dive a little bit deeper. But the first one's Philippians 4. Okay, here's what Paul says in Philippians 4. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, remember, remember, we're talking about the mind. Okay, that's an attention war. It's a battle for our mind. Here's what he says. Whatever's true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about such things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, if we refocus our attention, there's good things that can happen even when, even when you're kind of addicted to this. If you can start attending to this over here, it's going to be good. Okay, that's the first. Uh, second one, just write some of these references down, okay? Uh, 2 Corinthians 10.5, another good one. Uh, here's how it reads, the weapons we fight are not weapons of the world. They're not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, we have, they have divine power, divine power to demolish strongholds. You know, and I, I know <laughs> Paul didn't write neuroplastic, neuroplasticity there. No. In, in he, he wrote strongholds, but that's what these things are. They're, they're things that almost are wired, have been wired into us that are keeping us bound now. And Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians that we have access to divine power that can actually, actually take care of some of those things. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And, and here's the really one, we take captive every thought to make it obedience to Christ. Here's the lie, I think, of the attention war a lot of times is that um, you are a captive to your thoughts. We know our thoughts can influence us, right? But we're not captive to them. No. Right? Yeah, we have control. We do. Through Christ, we can actually take, we can start to fight back some of those thoughts. Um, here's the next one. Uh, Romans 8, 5. This is a great one. Write this one down too. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. And we're going to dive into this one a little bit more um, not just the next two weeks. We're going to dive into it a little bit more um, this weekend, okay? Um, and so Romans 8, 5 says, again, just once again, those who live in accordance with the Spirit, those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. There's another passage of Scripture that's going to make this a little bit more practical. Um, for us, it's Galatians 5, 22 through 23, okay? It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. So connect those two, right? We have Romans 8, we have Galatians 5. If we set our minds on what the Spirit has for us, uh, Galatians 5 says we're going to actually become a different person. Here's a, here's a horrible, I drew it illustration, okay, of what, <laughs> this is like, don't make fun of me. Don't, don't you laugh. Stop it. It's pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Okay, so, so listen. Um, here is the picture that Scripture kind of paints for us way better than, than my drawing, but, the, but, but it is. Okay, here's, here's you and me. If we focus our attention on everything about the Holy Spirit, and that's a, that's a really big category, okay? That's Scripture. That's the Word. That's community. That's, that's, just, that's obedience. These are doing the things with the people that God has called us to do and allowing, allowing those things to dictate to us who we are what we're about. It's experiencing the grace and the love and the mercy and the forgiveness of God. It's following him obediently in life. Here's what scripture says. It says this, once you, if you continue to do that, imperfectly all of us, okay, right? But if you do that, you become the type of person, okay? You become the type of person who is peaceful, loving, joyful, good, faithful, gentle, uh, patient, kind, self-controlled. These are the fruits that come out of your life. All right? I, I think the best weapon for us, the best weapon for us in this attention war 
that we find ourselves in is to start competing for our attention, competing for our attention with things that are way, way, way better for us, yeah. right? Yeah, it's really um, kind of back to that visual. It's like starting to see that chart skew in the other direction um, because I mean, just the comparison there, if you look at love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, yeah. compared to the fruit that we exactly right. listed below, it's, it's just way different. Yeah, it's a, it's a really sharp contrast, right? Because you could, you could use this graphic to explain the attention war. Yeah. Honestly, like, hey, here's me, and if we just superimpose that pie chart here, and we immerse ourselves in all these other things, okay? News media, and we're down the, the Fox News or the CNN rabbit hole, whatever, okay? Um, the, the YouTube rabbit hole, uh, the video game rabbit hole. And again, we're, we're careful to say, not all these things are bad, right? News isn't just bad by default. Video games, I like playing video games. I'm 40, I know I'm too old for it. Me and my son do that all the time together, okay? But listen, those things, as you allow those things to continue to trap your attention to the degree that they do, they will start to make you uh, exhibit different fruit in your life. That's what it comes down to. And the good news there, the good news there is it doesn't have to, but we got to start competing for our, uh, allow something else to compete for our attention, okay? So, so that's, a, that's kind of a, a, a big time uh, overview of really this kind of attention war um, idea, all right? And, uh, and so um, in a moment here, um, your campus pastor, your weekend host is gonna come up and they're going to give you some handles. Um, Cody's actually put together a resource that your weekend host is going to talk um, more about um, and connected you to some resources, okay? Um, but um, uh, before they do that, uh, I just want to say this, all right? Um, we have been, as a church, um, pretty intentional, uh, pretty intentional about um, not sticking our head in the sand on this, okay? Um, I think post-pandemic, um, I think um, post uh, quarantine and lockdown, um, I, I, I've seen a lot of uh, not just churches, but just a lot of people kind of go, ooh, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of close myself off and I want the world to go back to the way that it was. And I think that's probably the biggest mistake we could probably make. I think if there was one gift from the pandemic, it was this, the world has changed. And the, and, and, and the way the world has changed uh, just really specifically is we are in the digital age and it's not going away. We have to figure out how to contend, not just for the gospel, not just for our kids' lives, but even for, like, for our own minds in 2022 and beyond. We just have to, all right? And in light of that, this is a little bit of why it led us to um, hire Pastor Cody, and we're really so grateful that you're on our staff. Um, so uh, are people able to reach out to you if something this weekend kind of struck them or they want to know more? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, the online campus page on the, the website has my contact info. So we'd love to connect if you have any questions. Yeah. And, and Cody actually uses a, a service called Calendly. Mm -hmm. It's super easy to connect with him. Okay. But yeah, please, please do that. Um, don't send me an email. Send him all of the emails. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but really so grateful that you joined us this weekend, man. Um, your weekend host, again, is going to connect you here in a little bit uh, to more resources. But before they come up, uh, Cody, would you just join uh, and, and help lead all of us in prayer here? Let's, let's just pray together, okay? Uh, Father in, in heaven, we're so grateful. We're so grateful um, for your son, Jesus. We're so grateful for your word that, that incredibly has just uh, unbelievably relevant things to say. Um, unbelievably relevant things to say for us in, uh, in 2022. Um, Father, I know that there are some of us who are so aware that we are um, being impacted by this war for our attention, and I know most of us, God, most of us still feel either kind of unaware or maybe overwhelmed. And so, God, uh, would you just continue to help us see this, how we need to see it, and then more importantly, would you connect us, would you connect us to your truth in Scripture? And, and would you just continue to move us, God, to start um, inviting you and inviting your word and inviting your spirit and inviting your truth to compete for our attention. Um, God, we want to be people and we want to be a church that is not caught up in this war for our attention so that when this world truly needs you and it needs your light and it needs your love and it needs your truth, that we're bound up. God, we want to be free of that so that, so that 
we can see you clearly, and we can help others do the same. So bless us, God, as we uh, embark on this. Jesus, we pray all of this in your name. Amen. <music>